Hello and welcome to another episode of The Thriving Metabolism, where we discuss everything that impacts your hormones and metabolism so that you can take control, repair the damage and lose weight consistently without making yourself miserable in the process. Most weight loss strategies and diets actually do harm to your metabolism, resulting in further weight gain down the road. And it can be a particular challenge for women over 40 due to hormonal and metabolic changes. So it's my mission to empower you so that you and your metabolism thrives and you never have to go through diet misery again. I'm Louise Digby, registered nutritional therapist, weight loss expert, and founder of the Nourish Method to Lasting Fat Loss. This week, I thought we could talk about where you should start when you're ready to get results that will actually last. But as I'm saying this, I'm realizing that what I'm going to talk about isn't actually where you should start if you really want to be successful, because working on your mindset and your paradigm is always the best place to start. So I suppose it's the first nutrition slash lifestyle piece to work on that we're going to be talking about today. And just while we're touching on mindset, though, this week I've been listening to a really great book and I'm a big fan of audiobooks. You know, whether I'm walking or cleaning or driving, I will be listening to an audiobook. Now, I don't generally like to listen to self-help or personal development books because I find they have a much bigger impact when you're fully focused on it and you know reading it as opposed to listening to it. However, this book in particular, I've been listening to it and it's you know it's very conversational because it's actually a series of interviews with Bob Proctor. Bob Proctor, if you don't know, is a very successful man in the world of mindset and success. And the book is called Change Your Paradigm, Change Your Life. And it's not specific to weight loss, but rather success. And it entirely encapsulates how changing your paradigm or your mindset or outlook matters if you want to change your life for the better. And I'm on my second time around listening to it. And there's a good chance that I'm going to listen to it several times more because it's really powerful. It's been a long time since I've found a personal development book that wasn't full of waffle and wishy-washy nonsense. So I highly recommend that book. It's actually free on Audible the last time I checked. And um, I think you can also buy the book as well. Anyway, back to what we're really here to talk about. The first thing that you should focus on when it comes to the nutrition slash lifestyle piece for lasting weight loss, and that is balancing your blood sugars. Now, this is relevant to everyone. If you are not factoring in blood sugar balance into your approach for weight loss, you are setting yourself up for failure. Now, I think I'm going to get sick of saying blood sugar balance because I'm about to say it a lot. So I'm going to say BSB sometimes instead. So what is BSB and why should you care? The simplest way to explain this is that when you eat food that contains sugars or carbohydrates, they're digested down into glucose, which is your most basic type of sugar. And this gets absorbed into your bloodstream. It's then transported into cells to make energy. Now, I touched on this in the first episode, but unless you have type one diabetes, the hormone insulin is secreted by the pancreas and it facilitates the transport of the glucose into your cells. Insulin therefore helps to lower your blood sugar levels when they're too high. And if there's more glucose than our cells need, that glucose gets converted into fat and stored. So to put that simply, the food you eat impacts your blood sugars. Too high blood sugars drives fat storage. Now. What that means is that by being savvy with our food, we can control our blood sugars better. And that's really important because as well as uncontrolled blood sugars driving fat storage, it also triggers energy slumps, cravings, irritability, low willpower. It interferes with your hormones, including your thyroid, your sex hormones, stress hormones, your brain chemicals. Um, Imbalanced blood sugars also raises inflammation and disrupts sleep quality and more. And All those things I've just mentioned, they contribute to weight gain in one way or another. And if you're controlling what you're eating, let's say you're counting calories or reducing portions, eating low fat, working out, whatever your approach might be, but your blood sugars are still imbalanced with highs and lows, you're going to have a really hard time maintaining your progress because 
you're going to feel like crap. And you're also not going to be seeing the progress that you might expect because you're spending too much time with raised blood sugars and therefore raised insulin, which is our fat storage hormone. So you're going to be spending too much time in fat storage mode instead of fat burning mode. So that's why blood sugar control is so key for everyone, even if you've had a blood sugar test and it's shown that your blood sugars are normal. That is just a snapshot in time. And while it's great that your your blood sugars are not staying high for a long time after eating, we want to try and prevent highs and lows as much as possible to help you see steady progress and feel energized and not be battling cravings all the time. Now, to add a layer, another layer of complexity, it's not just about food. It's not just food that impacts your blood sugars. And that's why I keep saying, that this is the first nutrition slash lifestyle piece. And, you know, there are lifestyle factors that impact your blood sugars as well. So lack of sleep, high stress, over-exercising, food intolerance, smoking, alcohol, exposure to blue light from your devices, underactive thyroid, too much caffeine, certain medications. These are just some of the things that can raise your blood sugars, even if you're doing a great job with your food. And this is why a lifestyle change is required for lasting success. We can't just be thinking about food. And I know that can feel really overwhelming to hear because it can feel like there's so much that you need to work on. But trust me, it's okay. You know, we just have to break it down into baby steps. We can't make all these changes at once because we're human. We're not robots. So hopefully you're understanding now what blood sugars are, why they're important, and what things can impact your blood sugars. Now, after hearing about how carbs and sugars in the diet impact your blood sugar balance, many people think that the best thing to do food-wise is to go keto or very low carb. While in the Nourish Method, we never recommend high carb, the amount of carbs you might need will depend on a lot of factors like your activity levels or insulin resistance, your stress levels, how well your thyroid's functioning, your sleep quality. And we factor all of that in when we make our recommendations for our clients. So I can't be specific with carb recommendations on this platform because of that individual variability. But what I can say is that I see so many women who go keto or really low carb and do really well for a while, but then they end up with underactive thyroid or seriously stubborn weight. And it's because women in particular, they have a real need for carbs for their thyroid to function well. And that's particularly when you are perimenopausal and menopausal, because you're more likely to develop underactive thyroid during that time. So I tend to advise against going keto or very low carb, unless you're working closely with a registered nutrition practitioner who knows what they're doing. And in some cases, it can be a sensible move, but often in the very short term. But what I can guide you on today are recommendations that will be suitable for pretty much everyone when it comes to balancing blood sugars. This is all going to be stuff that we all should be doing So first of all, the most important thing is to include protein with every meal. Lots of people think that they eat lots of protein because they'll have a portion of meat with their evening meal. However, we need to be eating protein at every meal. Humans have a really high demand for protein and a deficiency of it drives hunger, cravings, and overeating. And protein is digested really slowly and that helps to slow down the absorption of your carbs and sugars, and that helps to even out your blood sugar levels. That's the first tip. And then secondly, don't snack on fruit, cereal bars, crackers, crisps, muffins, or anything else that has mostly carbs in. Even if the packaging says it's healthy, or if it says it's low calorie, or if it says it's a source of protein, it's... Even if it says it's a source of protein, that doesn't mean that it's rich in protein. You know, it's just clever marketing. Most of these foods, they contain mainly carbs and we really need a combination of proteins or fats and carbs to help prevent blood sugar spikes. So we could add in some plain nuts with your fruit or some almond butter, for example. Also, if you're needing to snack between meals, it's 
possible that you might not be eating enough at your main meals. So unless you're, you know, doing a workout and therefore need a bit of extra fuel, eating substantial main meals should really keep you going through the day. And if it's not, that's a sign that your blood sugars might be imbalanced and that's likely linked back to your meals not being balanced, likely not enough protein. And then thirdly, another really simple tip for balancing your blood sugars is you can take one tablespoon of apple cider vinegar in a glass of water before a carb heavy meal. And that's going to help to reduce blood sugar spikes. So meals like risotto and pasta bake, for example, are carbier. And so, you know, you don't necessarily have to go without these carbier meals. You just need to be savvy. And one of the easiest ways to do that is with apple cider vinegar before meals, particularly the carbier ones. And it sounds like a really random hack, but there's science behind it. And next, walking. Going for a short, gentle walk after a more carb-heavy meal helps to prevent blood sugar spikes. And it also really helps with digestion too. Many people report less bloating and indigestion or heartburn after they have gone for a walk after eating. So these are some nice and easy to implement tips for balancing your blood sugars. And that's really where you need to start when you're working on your nutrition and lifestyle for lasting weight loss. And it's also where you'd start if you wanted to boost your energy levels, to support your hormone balance, improve your skin health, improve your sleep, and pretty much every health issue. Balancing your blood sugars is really core to every other problem So getting your blood sugars balanced is going to help to improve your overall health. It's the first thing that we should be doing for whatever problem we're dealing with. So start there. Instead of restricting your food intake, start with balancing your blood sugars and your appetite will get better at regulating itself once your blood sugars are balanced. So you won't need to be worrying about counting calories, counting carbs, measuring portion sizes or whatever it is that you do to restrict your food. So focus on balancing your blood sugars instead. Okay, next we have my favorite fact from the week. I get a really great industry magazine that summarizes all the key research from the previous month. And one of the most interesting pieces that was in there this month was looking at the link between vitamin D and body fat. So the fact is, the higher your body fat percentage, the greater your need for vitamin D will be. And this is because with more body fat comes a greater difficulty synthesizing vitamin D. We make vitamin D from the sun and the further from the equator we get, the less opportunity we have to make it. Here in the UK, it's thought that we can only really make it during the summer in the peak hours of the day when we're not wearing any sun cream. Not many of us can say that we get out in the sun in the peak hours, exposing quite a lot of skin without sun cream on. And, you know, that figures because we test all our clients for vitamin D. And um, I'd estimate that only about 10% have optimal levels, if that. So what does this mean for you? Well, it means that it's probably a good idea to check your vitamin D levels. It means that you'll most likely have a high demand, at least to start with. But once your body fat percentage has reduced, your ability to make and store vitamin D may improve. So you may not need to supplement so much in the future. If you have a deficiency that you're aware of or you become aware of, please make sure you're taking a high dose supplement of at least 4,000 IUs or international units daily. So often we have women come to us with severely deficient vitamin D and they're only taking 400 IUs, which is such a small amount. It will never correct a deficiency. So why should you care about your vitamin D levels? Well, low vitamin D has been linked to an increased risk of autoimmune disease, cancer, obesity, mood disorders, fatigue, inflammatory disorders, skin complaints like eczema and psoriasis, risk of picking up viruses and infections like COVID. So there's lots of reasons to optimize your vitamin D and, you know, lots of uh, science to show that it really reduces your risk of certain conditions. Okay, next is time for me to go through a reader's letter. It's uh, quite a long email that I received, so I'm going to summarize it quite a bit. And for confidentiality, I'm not going to mention any names. So let me just pull it up in front of me. So 
She said, I'm 52 and perimenopausal. My weight has always been a challenge from my early 20s. During 2016, 2017, I joined Slimming World and I lost five stone. As soon as I left the group, gradually week by week, I was putting a pound or two back on despite still using a treadmill. At that time, life was always hectic. In April 2019, I had a TIA, which is a mini stroke. Suddenly overnight, I became fairly housebound. Gradually, I have regained this and worked at becoming far more active than I ever was. Amazing. Well done, you. Um, for the last year, I have been going to aqua gym, aqua aerobics and Pilates. Um, I'm missing out a big chunk here, but basically she was put on medication and one of the side effects can be weight gain and fatigue. And she said, a few weeks ago, I was diagnosed with silent reflux. They prescribed me Gaviscon in advance, which then inhibits the absorption of iron, which she needs to take, by the way. So I only use it when it's really bad. Otherwise, I just try to avoid food triggers. So my question is, have you any ideas on what I can eat to balance my good gut bacteria? And how should I go forward to lose weight? I'm currently 16 stone seven. So Slimming World doesn't work as they know you'll put it back on and more. Please help. I really don't know where to start. Okay, well, first of all, please know that you're not alone. You know, while your medical history is unique to you and no one's had the same experience as you exactly, we receive messages similar to this every day. You know, your struggle to make progress is not a character fault. It's not an inability to follow a diet. The problem is what we've been taught about how to lose weight and the typical diets that are available to us. So for you and for anyone who has other health things going on, it is best to focus on getting to the root of those issues rather than focusing on the number on the scales. You know, it's it's great that you're asking questions about improving your gut health. Weight gain is a symptom of imbalance in the body and that can be an imbalance in the gut and hormones, inflammation, your liver, etc. So addressing those imbalances will result in weight loss. And the gut is always a great place to start. And we actually almost always start there ourselves with our clients because the testing that we do assesses gut health and nine times out of 10, there's significant imbalances within the gut environment, even when there were no obvious digestive symptoms. And as you're experiencing reflux, it's a good idea to see whether you've been tested for bacteri a bacterial infection called Helicobacter pylori or H. pylori. This bacteria infects the stomach that suppresses stomach acid levels and it results in food not being properly digested, gas production, and then that gas production causes pressure, which results in reflux. It can be a little bit confusing because I'm talking about there not being enough acid and that causing reflux. But, you know, we're always told that reflux, whether it's silent or not, is caused by too much acid, but actually, in most cases, it's actually not enough acid. So H. pylori is a really common infection. It actually came up on a test of mine a few years back, and it doesn't always cause problems, but it's worth checking out. And it can be checked through blood, stool, breath, and endoscopy when you have the tube down your throat. So looking back at any testing like that, that you might have had done, um, to see if you've had this test done is a good idea. The likelihood is that you probably haven't been checked for it. And if you ask your doctor to check for it, then they may well do that for you. Next, really simple, but make sure you are chewing your food properly. Really boring, I know, but I cannot emphasize enough how important it is to do it. Your food should be a puree before you swallow it. Chewing food thoroughly not only helps you to register when you're full sooner, but it also reduces reflux, improves nutrient absorption and reduces bloating. And then apple cider vinegar, again, it, you know, I mentioned it earlier to support blood sugars, but it's also great to aid digestion, even when you have acid reflux. If it makes your reflux worse, then definitely stop. But in most cases, it can really help. And there's so much good stuff in apple cider vinegar. It's got enzymes and the acid, which helps you to digest. If you get a good organic uh, apple cider vinegar with the mother, then it can be rich in beneficial bacteria as well and antioxidants. So it's a really lovely addition for loads of reasons. And it can really help you to digest your food a little bit better and support that gut environment. So that's where I would start with supporting your gut, which in turn will help support your weight loss journey. 
I hope that you found that answer helpful and that gives you a few things to focus on to get started. Thank you so much for joining me today. If you'd like to talk to me about anything that I've discussed in this episode, you can reach me on Facebook or Instagram by searching at Louise Digby Nutrition, or you can email me with your question to be answered on the podcast like I have today. And you can reach me at louise at louisedigbynutrition.com and pop podcast in the subject so that I know that your question is for the podcast. If you're enjoying this podcast, please head to Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Click follow and leave a review. Doing so will massively help. Following helps more people to discover the podcast. Thanks again and I'll see you next time. Bye.